So in this video, I just want to talk about PWM for audio specifically, um, but I'll start by giving kind of an overview of PWM um, before we move on to audio, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, I'll talk about two methods for PWM and how increasing the sampling frequency for PWM affects our resultant audio waveform. Um, so just kind of the overview of, of PWM, which is a, a pulse width modulated signal, you can essentially think of it as, as like a, a square wave where we can control the duty cycle of the square wave. Um, so the one that I have on the screen here is 50% duty cycle, which means it's high just as often as it's low, or it's one just as often as it's zero. Um, so the length of every cycle is 10, which means specifically we have five ones and then five zeros. Now, this will be called the integrative method because the mean, it's very easy to see the mean of this signal is one half. Um, and perhaps more importantly, the if we low pass this signal, if we treat this PWM signal on the top as being in the time domain and we just low pass it, the resultant time domain signal is also essentially a flat line at 0 0.5. And so you might use this with a microcontroller or something where you want to create some specific amount of DC voltage, but you know you only have this this pin on your microcontroller that can only be in two states it can only be zero volts or just to keep it consistent here let's say it can only be zero volts or one volt um, but if you use this duty cycle and kind of have it bouncing back and forth between zero volts and one volt at 50 percent duty cycle then the effective voltage will essentially be half a volt and you know if you have an led connected to that It'll be it'll be doing this so fast that your eye can't perceive the the flickering, but because it's off half the time, you can certainly perceive the fact that it is less bright than if it were on all the time. Um, and so we can do any duty cycle we want if we are willing to dedicate the proper number of samples to it. So if I wanted to do a 75% duty cycle, I can't do that with 10 samples because it would require me to have seven and a half samples. I obviously can't have half a sample. So if I try and do this, what I'm gonna end up with is rounding the duty cycle up to 80%. And because I only have 10 samples per cycle, that means I'm gonna have eight ones and two zeros. And you can see the resultant low pass version is, uh, it converges on 0.8. Now, the next uh, integer number of um, samples I can use to achieve this kind of perfect 75% duty cycle would be to go up to 12. Or I could go, I could even go down to, to four samples and have three high and one low. But I've gone up to 12 and now I have nine high and three low, which you can see before I was kind of rounded to 0 0.8. I'm a little bit lower than that. If I zoom in, you can see that the low pass version is now converging on 0 0.75, which is what I intended. Um, just talk about this algorithm really briefly. How I'm creating the duty cycle or creating the actual PWM waveform, as I'm saying, um, I have to do my, my rounding. So I end up with an integer number of bits um, or an integer number of samples. Um, but I'm basically just taking the duty cycle and multiplying it by the length. So 0 0.75 times the length is 9, and then I'm doing the length minus that. So that would be 12 minus 9 is 3, and that's how I end up with 9 ones and 3 zeros. I'm just passing those as arguments into a function that creates a vector of ones and a function that creates a vector of zeros. And so that's how I generate nine ones and three zeros. Uh, there's another method called the intersective method. This slide I've lifted completely from another presentation, which I will link below. Here's the reference for the people who created that uh, PowerPoint. There'll be other references in the description below as well. But the intersective method is this, uh, another method of creating the PWM, or instead of trying to create a single sample based on the average of the PWM waveform, we're using this comparator method 
by uh, taking a reference, in this case a sawtooth, and saying, is the signal we're trying to recreate higher or lower than the reference sawtooth? And based on whether it's higher or lower, the resultant PDM, PWM sample at that instance is either a one or a zero. Um, but that's how we're going to use this for audio, where I'm talking about, you know, kind of really long term, this PWM essentially converges on average to some intermediate value. I'm going to look at every individual audio sample I have and try and approximate that amplitude by using a PWM. So the PWM can only be two values, it can only be zero or one. And my traditional audio waveform, you know, CD quality audio is encoded at 16 bits of depth. Um, that means there's 65,000 possible values. Um, but I'm going to attempt to recreate those values using a PWM waveform by adjusting the duty cycle so that on average, the resultant PWM is the intended amplitude. And so they are kind of inherently, if you can put that together, PWM is this other method of encoding audio where I have to use a lot more samples in time, which is a trade-off with the fact that I don't have to use almost any bit depth. It's, it's decimated to a single bit. Every individual sample is either a zero or a one. So I need much more of those samples so that I can essentially integrate that PWM waveform and get that kind of average amplitude, but I don't need as much bit depth. Um, so moving on to me comparing these two methods for audio, uh, I'm just going to create a single sinusoid at 500 hertz. That's my target. Uh, our audio rates are usually 44.1 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz. I'm just going to round up to 50 kilohertz to have a nice round number. Um, I'm going to look at the spectrum of that input, which is just going to be a, a perfect sinusoid at, at 500 hertz again. And I'm going to start by using a PWM sampling frequency that's twice my audio frequency. Um, so not a ton of resolution there. Uh, for the intersective method, I'm creating a sawtooth reference, which you do by taking the arctangent of a cotangent. Um, and then the PWM is just going to be, like I said before, if one is higher or lower. Than, that, than the other. I'm just taking the sign of the difference between them. And this is hopefully not going to cause too much confusion later, but this is more convenient. Instead of having zeros and ones, I'm going to have negative ones and ones. And because my sinusoid is bounded between negative one and one, low passing the PD, PWM where its two possible values are negative one and one is going to give me the desired kind of resultant audio waveform. Um, so the, the, there's still only two possible values. It's just that the, the lower of the two possible values is negative one instead of zero. And then there's the integrative method where I'm doing that same thing where I I'm taking ones and zeros and just kind of stacking them up against each other to try and hit some target value. Um, and this is what it looks like. So. The blue line is our reference audio waveform. This is the input. This is what we're trying to achieve. The sampling rate of the PWM waveform for both methods is twice that of the audio rate. And it stands to reason that there are really only three possible values that the integrative method can achieve. Um, so for every individual sample, of the audio waveform, I get two samples of the PWM waveform. And again, that's dictated by the fact that the PWM sampling frequency is twice the, the audio sampling frequency. So I get two samples for every audio sample. If both those samples are high, one, then the mean will be one. If both those samples are low, negative one, then the mean will be negative one. If one is high and the other is low, one and negative one, the mean will be zero. So you can see that when the sine wave that I'm trying to approximate is high, the PWM and for the integrative method is essentially just stuck high. When the sine wave for 
the audio signal that I'm trying to achieve is low, the PWM for the integrative method is stuck low. And in between, it's essentially just at a 50% duty cycle. That's all it can do is either be stuck at one, stuck at negative one, or on a 50% duty cycle. If you kind of read between the lines here, you kind of have this flat section at one, this flat section at zero, this flat se section at negative one, flat section at zero, flat section at one, flat section at zero, so on and so forth. Um, and that's all the, inter sec the integrative method can achieve. Um, I have less of an intuitive understanding of the intersective method, so I'm not going to say much about it. You can see that the amplitude here uh, in the what should be the negative region, well, it is, it's negative, but it doesn't quite reach uh, as far low as it should, and that's because there's still some, some action here. So the mean here is, negative, is, is never going to be truly negative 1 because there's still some kind of intermediate spikes up to 1 here. And so this never achieves the the negative amplitude that it's that it's really supposed to. The intersective method does not. And then the power spectra, you can see, you know, there's tons of noise and plenty of harmonics uh, that are generated. Um, but this is a pretty low resolution PWM. Sampling frequency is only twice that of the original audio frequency, which means that I'm taking those 65,000 possible values and I'm, for every single one of them, only using three possible amplitude values to approximate them, which is pretty low resolution. Now, if I double the sampling frequency of the PWM, you'll see that I've populated this waveform with twice as many points all of a sudden. If I toggle back and forth, you know, there's twice as many points, which gives us twice the accuracy. Um, so all of a sudden, our sine wave is starting to look much better and pretty quickly. And if you look at the power spectra, you can see that the harmonics are diminished somewhat, the noise is diminished somewhat. And let's just go all the way up to eight times the sampling frequency again. There's a ton of points here now. I can do um, many more different duty cycles. I guess that means I can do nine possible values um, between zero or between negative one and one specifically here. Um, so it's the ratio plus plus one. Um, so to start, I had three possible values for the PWM, for the mean of the PWM, really, of course. To be clear, the only two possible values for the PWM at any given sample are negative one and one, but the, the I'm trying to approximate the audio sample, so um, the mean can be three possible values, the mean here can be five possible values, and the mean here can be nine possible values. So I'm still essentially uh, encoding my original waveform, which was at 16 bits, let's say, as something that's only three bits um, to the power of three is eight. Um, and I, you know, I can, of course, keep increasing this and get increasing fidelity here. Um, but we have surprisingly good results with only using this this three bit PWM or a PWM that's sampled at eight times the original audio rate. Um, and again, you can see the harmonics and the noise have diminished relative to the the previous um, example. Um, <clears throat> Actually looks like the noise on the integrative method has increased. Maybe that just has to do with my FFT length. Uh, I'm not sure I'll have to look at that, but in general, um, this is just kind of my introduction to PD PWM. Uh, I don't know much about it again, um, but just starting to experiment with it for the first time. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll put a bunch of links to things that have helped me down in the description.